Where's my Scott? Is he back there? I'm here. Oh. <laughs> We're looking at Passing Train from 1947-48. And this was painted around the time of A.B.'s retirement from his teaching at KU. He had a mild heart attack that uh, it wasn't, so mild. wasn't so mild. But he recovered well. Was that before this picture or, or after? Before, I think. Before. I think I finally found a date for it for Frank Barron. And while, of course, I don't remember it precisely, I think it was 1947. Hmm. This is done on canvas, and I think after that point, he didn't want to work on uh, the masonite, which was so heavy. Right. So from that point on, he tended to work on canvas, straight canvas. Right. right. He had to raise that uh, part of the easel up when he wanted, wanted, when he was working on an area that needed to be more or less at eye level. Mm -hmm. Now, by this time, um, A.B. had been going to Falls Village, Connecticut in the summers for several years, and you've always thought that this painting was inspired by uh, experiences he had there. Can you tell us the story of the passing train? No. The train ran between New York and uh, uh, Pittsfield, Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> and it took about three hours between the two points. And there were two trains a day, and one of them was at night. This was the night train. Everybody would go out and look at the passing train. It was one of the events, you know, in Falls Village. So we always went out at night when the weather permitted and watched the train. And uh, of course, there was much else besides the train. Uh, in that area, it was a wonderful place with many, many associations. Does this feels li feel like Falls Village to you? Uh, I wouldn't say exactly Falls Village as a geographical part of the country, <laughs> uh, but spiritually speaking, yes. Our, our personal Falls Village. Did he make the drawing up there? There is a drawing called Passing. There's a drawing. Well, he didn't paint in Falls Village. No. no. He, he made drawings up there a good deal every summer, I think. Yes, and there is this drawing, which was made there. What do you think some of the images are in this piece? Is that you and he standing there on the left? Well, of course, yeah. you know, so to speak. Uh, Pictorially, uh, no, these, uh, this is not a portrait of right. him and me. Right. <laughs> but this, we are watching a passing train and a lot of other things that go with the train. The pass. <laughs> the pass, the passing, uh, the past, and uh, maybe even the future. <laughs> Yeah, right, and there's the, this little figure sitting by the roadside, and uh, he said to me sometime, I don't know when, probably after the picture was painted, he said, of course he's sick, you know that, don't you, of this little fellow. Oh. And that was getting very specific. And uh, that's all I know about it. What did A.B. usually say to people when they asked him what a painting meant? Oh. <laughs> well, I know exactly <laughs> what he said because he wrote it. 
he, in one of his little aphoristic things, he, so to speak, indirectly quoted that and said, what does this picture mean? How should I know? I only painted it. <laughs> and this is not just a wisecrack. If you think about it, you know, a whole biography could be written from that, and a whole philosophy could be developed from that. And he was certainly interested in having other people work their own philosophies. Yeah, right. This to me is one of the great later pictures, one of the great pictures, period. Yeah. Because of the, the depth and richness of the imagery, of the composition, mm -hmm. of the color, uh, we have that kind of uh, gossamer whiteness that, that radiates throughout the painting. Imparting to it, in this case, uh, a spiritual quality, but, but even a kind of ghostly quality. I find this a kind mm -hmm. of uh, this whole painting is like an apparition right, to me. It is. By this time, Scott, he had reduced his palette in a, in a kind of interesting way. Yeah, he uh, was largely working with earth colors, and uh, the experiment, well, experiment or, or the effort was to use very simple colors, but in such a way that they would uh, have a greater power a greater strength um, and you know even using just pale browns and greens by combining them in certain ways he could create purples and bright yellows and you know just a, a you know, very glowing effect um, and Anna isn't it that he he felt confident <coughs> that the earth colors would be most long-lasting uh -huh. where he, as he was a little uncertain about some of the brighter colors not lasting as well, right. which may or may not be the truth, and yeah. I, I don't think it was necessarily, but that was part of his thought there. I think it was at one time. Mm. You know. Perhaps earlier on, yeah. yeah. Uh, but he had also a spiritual affinity with the earth tones, and uh, he uh, had, he lived with them so long that he could make uh, an earth red look like a lizard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He could make them glow. And this painting, it seems to me, is a painting of light. The, it seems to be incandescent. The light seems to come from the painting, out of the picture, toward you. And there are certain uh, paint techniques that he used to, to get that effect. By working oh, tell with, us. <coughs> hmm? tell us. Yeah, uh, by working with underpainting of, of uh. transparent hues, and then frosting over with these white lines and off-white lines, uh. it, it it sort of created a three-dimension uh, and glowing quality, yeah. uh, so that the light seems to be coming from the painting instead of reflect reflecting from it. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, this piece with so many white lines and different complex lines, it, it almost looks like a tapestry. It looks like it's a woven yeah. piece. And uh, many of his pieces from the American period uh, can have that effect. Right. Let's cut and move to another one. We're going to do some, uh, which one is it? Uh, summer Night? Sounds rolling. Okay. Rolling. Okay, so. Start with Bob there. Can you do Maybe a clapper? Oh, that's right. Okay, cut the sound. Cut sound. Okay. I just remembered the drawing on this, this particular painting. Well, I... the later drawings are paintings in a way. They he, are. He, he made them when he couldn't paint for whatever reason of light or health or whatnot. And uh, they're so colorful. To me, they are paintings. The color that he could draw out of pen right. on paper. Right. What's the relationship between those drawings and the paintings? Uh, I don't know. 
Did the drawings always I can't come say first? offhand. Did the drawings come first? Usually, yes. Almost right. always in the later years. Early on, he would often make drawings after a painting of him, of mm. his own, mm -hmm. uh, and include that in the title, as I know. I think but, that he used the terminology note for a picture often, on some of the yeah, drawings. Often, yeah. And really, they would be notes because the final picture would look quite a bit different than the oh, drawing, often, although the often drawing often sort of leads different. them in the direction of the yeah. picture. Yeah. And that's a fascinating thing to compare, yeah. especially for the art historian. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I dream of, Anna knows this, I dream of doing an exhibition where we'll hang the painting with the yeah. drawing next to it yeah. Yeah. And, and let that dialogue take place. Uh, It'll well, be a tricky one, though. Well, light levels <laughs> would be a problem. Yeah. But Anna, you've talked about how he would have uh, a stack of drawings on the table here next right to his here, chair, and yeah. he would leaf through them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, was usually in the ink on uh, watercolor paper. Right. right. Yeah, he carefully kept these scraps of watercolor paper to make drawings on. He liked the tooth and the resistance it gave. Well, he could also probably, I don't know, did he work in his lap or did he work always on a table with the drawings? Always on a table. Okay. Um, unless we were out and all different people. And that's one, and the one I took of A.B. Yeah. I lost. Excuse me. All right, are we... We're looking at the blue bow. Well, we're trying to. <laughs> the blue bow is another one of the really splendid late pictures. Yeah. With that marvelous blue limb that winds its way up along the right side of the picture. And then there's a crucifix at the upper right and a hooded figure climbing a path in that direction. Why do you think that Bloch used these particular images? Are you asking me? Anna, why do you think that Bloch <laughs> used these particular images? I don't know because uh, my my guesses are simply that uh, one is that this particular crucifix had something to do with the shrines which he often spoke of, which he actually put in drawings a time or two, and I can show you one. Not the drawing, but a photograph of it. Um, that he used to pass in walking um, in Europe. In Germany, there would be, you know, walking paths through the woods, and every once in a while you'd come to a wayside shrine. And uh, I have felt that this might be related to that although it's rather large for a shrine image. And actually, you know, he never depicted the crucifixion. He made many pictures of mourners with the crosses way off somewhere. But, uh, and he made a painting with the, the Christ who had been taken down from the cross. And uh, as, anyway, but he, is ne he never, that I know of, painted a crucifixion. So it seems hard to put a real one here in this painting. So I don't know, anyway. You guess now. I've guessed. You guess. <laughs> I've always thought of the blue, the blue bough as a tree of life, mm. and that it, it seems to be guiding symbolically the path of that pilgrim up this steep road. But what's remarkable about this painting is that those trees are all in the foreground, and then the the human figures are pushed into the background, so that you yeah. read through the the forest to find the the human activity in the background. 
Here's another marvelous example of that earth palette, yeah. now enlivened with blue, which becomes yeah. a very striking element. Let's cut. I don't feel like we have a lot to say about this. So we need to say no. um. Worker? Okay. This is arabesque masked motley from 1955. Albert Block painted clowns throughout his life. <laughs> Why that fascination with clowns, do you think? Well, it, it appeared very early in his life oh. and, uh, and kept on appearing now and then, less often in the later work, but it's there. But they tend not to be funny anymore, you know? They tend to be ominous or... Uh, Fearful. Um, you talk. This this one is, I think, rather sinister. Yeah. Remember, I took this home once. You let me borrow it for a day, uh. and um, my wife was afraid it would scare our little boy. <laughs> <laughs> and did it? Well, well I'm you, not, I'm you, not you sure brought we, it back right away. I'm not sure we let him look at it. Yeah. I'm uh. not sure it would scare Alex. <laughs> I don't think anything would scare Alex. <laughs> this, this again is, is a remarkable example of the complexity and richness and fullness of Bloch's later work. Uh, this is a picture that, that you could look at for literally hours and keep seeing new things. Well, it's, it's, uh, it just shows how uh, widely varied humor can be. I mean, humor is not just simply funny. Humor right. is sinister at times. It, yes. uh, you know, it just goes all over the place. Uh, right. And I think that that's what's being explored and it can be used um, for all of these different purposes. Right. Um, I think it's amazing how strong an ambiguous situation can be. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. there's so much suggestiveness in there and yet it's so powerfully depicted without freezing it. There is a lot of motion to, to uh, their faces um, and their gestures. Uh, you know, I, you know. It's hard to imagine four faces being more different. Each one is, is so remarkably specific. Each mask has its own character. Each grin or smile uh, is unique. And then when you combine the four of them, it, it becomes almost overwhelming yeah. as a combination. Particularly the density, uh, with them crowded in like that, it, it, it increases the, the drama and the power. Uh, you know, it's also interesting to look at their mouths. Each one has a totally different mouth, and, and the use of teeth or no teeth is an important part of, you know, this use of humor. Bob, you mentioned uh, Fasching, the, the German Mardi Gras. And that's when they actually do dress up in these wild costumes with these funny masks. And one wonders, uh, or one supposes, that that must have had an impact on Bloch when he saw that sort of thing in Munich. I'm sure it did. But of course, he'd been, he loved clowns even when he was in St. Louis. So right. it's, it's a deeply rooted interest of the artist. Also. Uh, the, the clown on the left, you can see that there's a mask on his face, so you can sense that that's a, a yeah. man wearing a mask, but the others, you, you don't see that, so you almost feel that they're the true image that they're representing, uh, which is part of what you were saying, Bob. It, it jumps through the ambiguity uh, and back again. That death's head at the right is, is truly, truly frightening. I think that may be one of the most frightening things that A.B. ever painted. Okay. Is that enough? Yeah, cut. Everybody just look at the painting for a minute. Can we get a shot of everybody looking at, looking at the painting?
Get out of there, Jimbo. Pull the cord. Okay. Go ahead and start. This is a painting from 1955 called Fugal Variations on a Mountain Theme. What's the significance of that title? Well, I think that he chose that title because he couldn't bear to relate it to what it is related to, which is the Beethoven uh, variations. Wait a minute, what's it called? Oh, no, it's called The Great Fugue. Yeah. Uh, it was the last movement of one of the late quartets of Beethoven which the publisher sent back to him and said, it's too big for the quartet. <laughs> uh, so Beethoven uncharacteristically wrote another final movement for the piece. And this is often played separately as a separate thing. And it's great that way too. But uh, anyway, uh, he really was too modest to compare himself to Beethoven. But the drawing gives it away. He made the drawing first, and it's, he related the title of the drawing to the great view. It seems like this painting is almost too big for the canvas, too. Right. It has a lot That's going right. on. That's right. That's right. The publisher will send it back and yeah, say, right. do another one. <laughs> Wait, this one uh, seems to reach back to the German Expressionist period, to me. Um, you know, it almost has those mountains just climb like they broken climb. ice cubes. They do. Uh, and, uh, you know, there really is, is an expressive quality and a very strong use of color. Yeah. Um, which in 1955, I think he's, he really pulled, moved back to stronger colors. No, he used the same colors, but yeah. he had mm -hmm. found out how to make them. <laughs> Even stronger. Yes. Yeah, and, and that's evident here. This also comes from an inner something, a change in his whole outlook. Uh, World War II had so, and the and the aftermath had so, uh, what shall I say, depleted him almost. Anyway, it had affected him so terribly that it shows in all his work up to the last decade. And then he got beyond that into uh, a realm of the spirit that was that left that behind, mm. and uh, almost everything in the last decade is has this quality of being beyond all the worldly grief. More That's, than grief, I mean, almost beyond all the other worldly right, things too. Right. Really. Right. But with such conviction. Yes. Mm. Nothing soft. And Sentimental right. about it. No. Not this God painting. Knows. No. I've always felt this is one of his boldest and even toughest paintings yeah. of the it last is. years. Yeah. Anna, you mentioned the idea that he's well, let me extrapolate. It's almost like he's creating another world on the canvas. That's not this world, but but in some ways a better world or a more interesting world, a more beautiful world, a more profound world. In some cases, a happier world. In other cases, right. a more sorrowful one. Right. And it all happened here in this room. <laughs> well, actually, you know, it didn't all happen right here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he didn't do all his painting right here. <laughs> uh, it came from his life and all his experiences. Uh, and he had experiences that uh, he was not physically involved in, as for example, the war. He was not on the front, if there were, or any of the front. So, uh, and uh, he always said he did some of his best painting in, in the bathtub, <laughs> 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 where he liked to have a warm, relaxing bath.
I think you said once that the idea for the blue bow came to him in the bathtub. Well, yeah, it did. <laughs> so this anyway... Is... I don't think this one did. <laughs> <laughs> no. Maybe he but turned it's... some cold water on by mistake. <laughs> but... <laughs> anyway, you can't confine it to this little space. That's all I meant. So go on and talk. I remember listening to music over here, and um, A.B. had the score, and they had a, actually an old wind-up machine, and uh, it was marked, and A.B. would do that, and had to jump up and change it up. Sounds rolling. Sounds rolling. Right, please. Mark it. Mark it. Okay. Good, David. This painting is called Impromptu, dates to 1959, and it's the last painting that Bloch completed before his death in 1961. He used the title Impromptu more than once over his career. It's a kind of musical title. What, what is impromptu about this, do you think? What is the moment that's captured? I think that perhaps when he started painting it, he had no idea what he was going to be, be painting. Once in a while this happened, he would put up a canvas and sort of play with color and form and line. Hmm. And that would lead him into painting whatever he ended up painting. It was an impromptu in that sense. But I'm not sure about this one, whether that was the case or whether he just gave it that title for an unknown reason. But see how the, the figure or the depiction of the tree or figure so forth and the ground behind it uh, define each other. It's To me, it mm -hmm. looks as right. if it were found in the process of painting. I maybe Yeah. Know, I? Well, that could very well be. I don't truly remember. Did he invite you up to the studio while he was painting? Always. You know, he would... I had other things to do, of course, <laughs> than watch him paint, which he would have loved. <laughs> but... Uh, Whenever he'd get to a stopping place, he'd give me a whistle, and I'd come up if I could. I managed usually to do that. <laughs> and we'd sit and look at what he had got so far, and uh, we'd talk about it. Maybe, and maybe we wouldn't, you know. Would he ask your opinion about uh, yeah. how things were going? often, often. And uh, I would give, sometimes I would make a suggestion, and uh, uh, very frequently he would say, well, that's an idea, and then he wouldn't do it at all. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway. This is a very strong piece. I, I yeah. see uh, in the foreground uh, the trees, which seem to be living trees and real trees, but have no foliage then there seems to be a fence uh, demarcation between the foreground and the background, but then the trees in the background seem to be of another world, almost like the fence is, is, is the demarcation between this life and an afterlife. Right. And I, the figures in the afterlife are, are doing different things, one walking into a dark doorway, one just sort of flying in an orange cloud, and the other leaning against a tree. But the trees, I think, is the comparison the afterworld trees and the this world trees, uh, and this being Bloch's last painting, a, you know, this yeah. could be a very, very important statement. Well, I think, I think it is Scott. This one he painted on on directly on Masonite, uh, on the toothy side of the Masonite. It's the only painting that I know of that he painted on on Masonite in that way. It, it has a one. Pardon. 
There's one other. But one other. It's a long time before this uh, one. But it gives it a, a, you know, a very strong texture. Um, right. You know, it, it en enlivens the surface um, uh, in a coarse kind of way. Yeah. Uh, but it's a very strong painting, and to yeah. do such a strong painting at the very end of his painting career, um, gosh, he's David in his 70s at this point? He never got beyond them. <laughs> well, yeah. like some of our friends. <laughs> right. <laughs> like many of our many friends, of our unfortunately. Friends. But again, the strong colors, a lot yeah. of um, uh, primary colors, yellow, blue, red. Um, you know, real, clearly a, a primal painting. Yeah. What was it like to be up in the studio with A.B. when there were other visitors? Well, it depended on the visitors. <laughs> uh, no, usually the people who came up here were admitted, you know. <laughs> they were select. <laughs> and they were... Uh, uh, Sometimes there were students, sometimes there were anybody, you know, but uh, it was always pleasant to me. What would the exchange be like between Block and a visitor? Well, um, he wouldn't, he, he refused, as you know, to talk about his painting. Uh, he'd always say, if I could have, if I could have, talked it, I wouldn't have painted it, you know. Painting was a different language. So what did they talk about? I mean, if they weren't talking oh, about the painting. Did, did well, they dare to of, offer a commentary oh, on his painting and his presence? Oh, sure. It depended. Yeah. <laughs> how how brave of, they were. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he, was, he intimidated a lot of people, didn't he? Yeah, but mostly those were people who didn't know him. Well enough to be up in the studio. <laughs> so if you got, if you came up these stairs, you were already you already passed a certain test. Oh right, you know? I guess so. I must have. I well, have not you. I mean, if one came up right. these stairs, yeah. was right. invited up the stairs. Wouldn't you say so, Bob? Oh, very much. Bob, do you remember your first time coming up here? Oh yes, I, I was terrified. <laughs> <laughs> you were a, were you a student at that a young student oh, at that yeah. point? Oh yeah, yeah. Remember when I brought Katie Sewell up here? 